Good evening and welcome to Gana Shot. Gana Shot mein aap sab ka swagat hai. Pranam, Jaihind and Sasriyakal. Today we are going to talk about the inevitable and irrevocable decline of Chinese power. I'm going to do this talk in English and discussion in English and I'd welcome your uh, views on the topic. The Hindi version, I will uh, you know, talk on Jaipur Dialogues sometime later in this week or next week. Uh, by then, I would have had some ideas refined and that maybe put some more in and take some out. It will depend on how, what uh, feedback I get. <clears throat> These days, uh, you find a lot of uh, videos and articles on the collapse of China and China's economy is gone, and this, that, all that. It's a, it's a knee-jerk reaction. Everyone talks of the 40-year rise of China, and all of a sudden, it's come unraveling. But in my opinion, it started unraveling in 2010, 2012, sometime then. It's not something new. It's only that I was in the majority of one when I spoke like that. Way back in 2017, I wrote an article called China, an overstretched hegemon. And then the BRI was coming. And the BRI made no sense. At that time, I knew the collapse of China was matter of time all right but then events happened the pandemic came and once the pandemic came and the way china started behaving and the way it, uh, it's zero covid xyz it was very clear that things are going downhill completely there is no one single factor which has led to this uh, state of affairs as to what I'm going to talk of. It's part systemic, it's part geopolitical, and it's part internal politics. It's systemic to China, or the internal systemic of China. So we'll take as much as possible a 360-degree view of why I say that the decline of Chinese power, I'm not talking of economy, is inevitable and irrevocable. I'll give you my reasoning. Based on what you say, I'm going to come out with a second edition, depending on the feedback I get. OK. Often, you know, for the past two years, whenever I have analyzed uh, China, Hemingway's quote comes to my mind completely. It's in one of his books, he says, how do you go bankrupt? Two ways, gradually and then suddenly. As far as China is concerned, it's a gradually it is, hap it is happening. When will that suddenly happen? We don't know. I can't predict. But it's going to happen. And it's going to happen in ways which we have not probably imagined, and it's already probably happening. And towards the end, I, I, I'll hazard a guess there. Now, today's discussion and my analysis is broadly in two parts. One part is from 2023 to 2030, what's going to happen, and thereafter. And that's the suddenly part. Okay. I have always been postulating that today Xi Jinping and the communist China are standing on a very weak edifice, which is a jelly bottom of demography and climate change, with their huge risk to both of them. Then, of course, the private sector, the consumption, the real estate, the food insecurity, jobs, infrastructure, exports, healthcare, all these are, are wobbly. These are the bricks, a wobbly set of bricks and an uncertain base is in what Xi Jinping 
is going gung ho with his diplomacy, technology, and military. And they're also not succeeding too much, but then that's a different story. Today, the idea is to see this basic edifice where it is going. If that doesn't go anywhere, the top three won't go anywhere either. Okay, I have spoken enough on many of these individually. So today we're going to talk as a joint affair as to where this whole story is heading. I have to go back to this document called China 2030. It's a beautiful document. It's one of the best documents I've seen on China, right, in the public domain, which describes China so well. And it is by the World Bank. It's called Building a Modern, Harmonious and Creative Society. It envisions a China of 2030. And you'll see what it envisioned and what is happening. Well, this was signed by three illustrious people who formed this committee to make this report by Robert Zolek, who is the president of the World Bank, Li Wei, President, Development Research Center of the State Council of the PRC. Now, the State Council of the PRC is something like a Cabinet Committee of Political Affairs and the Cabinet Committee of Security. Something you know, complete. The highest apex body of China. They have a development research center. He, the head of that was deputed to be part of the study. Right, and of course, Jim Yong Kim, who was also a president of the World Bank Group. Now, these three people signed. What was this story? The story was, this was done in 2013, just when Xi Jinping uh, came to power. And this was a joint exercise between the PRC and the World Bank. It was not a unitary thing. They both signed on this document. Right. So, in this context, it's important to see what's there in this document. Because you will understand everything else based on what is there in this document. Okay, let's see. Mota mota. You know, broadly, what was there in this document. The broad thing was, it had noted that China's economic performance had been impressive. GDP growth of 10% annually. Everyone knows it. It had noted that 500 million people were lifted out of poverty. Phenomenal. And today people talk of 800 million also, loosely in many videos. That's feasible. I'll not. But it was a great achievement. World's second largest economy and largest exporter and manufacturer. That was the achievement of China, which was significant. And this was in 2013. They identified the strengths of China. They said very high savings, increasingly plentiful skilled labor, and potential for further urbanization. What was the opportunity? The opportunity was continued globalization. You have to remember, we are talking of 2012-13, when globalization was the flavor of the day, and China was the cherry on the ice cream and promising new technologies. All these technologies were still over the horizon. AI, cyber, quantum, space. They were just appearing. They were exotic technologies. But prophetically, the report highlighted the importance of avoiding overconfident and remaining vigilant against potential problems from social, economic, and natural causes. Very important. So let's dive into that. What are the challenges identified? The challenges which they identified was worsening inequality, 
inefficiencies in social service and social service uh, delivery. And that resulted in distorted incentives and market structures. Rapid aging of the population was spoken of in 2013. Shrinking labor force, because by then the labor force had started uh, shrinking. High dependency ratios. As people were aging, it was forecasted that China will get old and there will be a need for these old people. China was destined to grow old before growing rich was predicted in this report in 2013. And this was signed by China. Managing a growing economic, social and cultural diversity. That was important. It was also noted that there were significant challenges of quality and efficiency in education, health services, and in social security programs. And this poor health and poor social security programs were brutally opened up during the uh, COVID. It was a lack of this which forced Xi Jinping to go into his strict zero COVID regime. Everyone says zero COVID regime. But look at it from Xi Jinping's viewpoint. If he had not done that, and with the kind of health and social services which, were, which are existent today in China, China would have been finished. And communism would have been finished. That was the risk. A vulnerable population, poorly inoculated by weak Chinese uh, vaccines with not with very few measures like what Xi Jinping instituted was a recipe for disaster. But then it was Hobson's choice for uh, uh, Xi Jinping. He could either go for zero COVID and suffer the consequences or do this and suffer the consequences. He chose zero COVID. They gave a six point strategy. This is interesting. They give a six point strategy for China to progress. And in my view, okay, we'll come to the end. We'll first talk of the six points of the strategy. First, implement the structural reforms to strengthen the foundations of a market based economy. That was the first uh, structural reform. What did Xi Jinping do? He said, to hell with it. I will go for a command-based economy, a state-based, state-controlled economy where this SOE is ruled. Second, accelerate the pace of innovation and create an open innovation system. He just destroyed it. The innovation system of China was in its private enterprises like Huawei, Alibaba, Tencent, Didi Chuxing, and Meituan. He broke them. He broke them to an extent that innovation finished off. Third, seize the opportunity to go green. He's done exactly that today with a profusion of coal plants which have come up. And why coal plants have come up, we'll talk later. Fourth, expand opportunities and promote social security for all. It was known at that time itself that social security was a weak link of China. Health services were a weak link of China. China was going to age. He didn't do it. The ex opportunities were not expanded. Strengthen the physical fiscal system. He neglected it. Today, the fiscal system is at uh, risk. Last point, very important. Seek mutually beneficial relations with the world. What has Xi Jinping done? He's taken to, he sought absolutely adversarial relations with the world. He's made USA his number one enemy. He has gone against India. He is now fighting with all his neighbors, water jets against the Philippines, running over Vietnamese trawler boats. 
he calls japan a risk today south korea he is worried about south korea and japan getting together all this is the past one week 10 days and of course taiwan australia europe has gone into the de risking strategy so he has not done this the last point which this is my point if the recommendations of this report were implemented even in part even if out of six recommendations if xi jinping had implemented three to four no one in this world would have stopped china from becoming a superpower this is my view but that was not to be it was in april 22 i mean august 22 last year i wrote this i said ailing china on a decline people probably didn't even look at my thing and if they looked at it couldn't care less i remember this article i had to pedal around to people and say why didn't you publish it no one would finally sunday garden did the one year back what did i say in that the answer to let me read it fully again i mean the crux of this whole thing the answer to some chinese elements is fundamentally structural change as recommended by the world bank study however at that time itself the political indications from china are that xi will continue with the old playbook of growth through debt finance infrastructure and real estate investment by then itself the evergrand had started collapsing any short term fix will only hasten the decline in the long run last year this is you can see this article it's on my website also hence an ailing china is concerned to decline in a couple of programs when i spoke of decline of china people poo pooed me off however as its economic influence wanes which it is happening it's already happened in sri lanka chinese militarism and diplomacy will push it towards geopolitical wrangling it's happening i may say it again it's i wrote it last year as its economic influence wanes chinese militarism and diplomacy will push it towards geopolitical wrangling xi jinping has had a technology into it that's where the first slide i showed diplomacy technology and military this is also on display across taiwan states and the lac it is dangerous to the world in india okay now let's trace this path because unless you trace this path which xi jinping has adopted since the day he has come to power we will not understand how it is declining and where china is going to go the first thing i must tell about xi jinping is his path has been zigzagging is put out a policy one day uh, another policy a third policy and a fourth policy which i spoke of in detail when i spoke of xi jinping and his personality that's there in my videos okay but let's look at this i'll i'll put the whole thing in in a uh, small form right when he started he started on the footsteps of deng xiaoping as in the leftmost Uh, picture but with that came the rider of anti corruption he that was when he started this bri the moment he took over as pres, uh, president he opened up bri and he spoke of doubling the economy everyone thought he is going after he is following the footsteps of xi jin uh, deng xiaoping anti corruption was barring anti corruption and everyone thought that anti corruption was going to be you know to consolidate his rule and and get rid of chi- get rid uh, china of corruption which was becoming endemic and threatening china largely but he had different ideas he followed xi jinping's footsteps but started wiping them clean he started wiping them clean with the xi thought xi jinping thought he started a story of dual circulation when he, his xi jinping thought steered china towards hardcore communism 
Yang left state control of the economy, etc., etc. This was the period of when you know COVID had started. Not sorry, not COVID had started. Uh, his second term had started, and he was giving indications to everyone that China will do everything on its own. And he started this dual circulation. He started made in China, so that China could become completely self-reliant and cut off everyone. Then that was a time he jettisoned Deng Xiaoping and shook hands with Mao. Then it came out his story of new development concept, a SWIP, state control, common prosperity. Common prosperity scared the hell out of everyone. The whole idea was to get money from the rich and give it to the poor. That's what he signaled to everyone. But it was not so. There was a deep economic thought behind it and which I will talk about later. But the signal which he gave to people was this. When he broke Alibaba, when he broke Tencent, when he broke Meituan, Didi Chak Singh, when he broke the educational, financial uh, and tech sector, this was the signal he gave. Then he leaned towards his SOEs. Then he wanted to become great. Then came the 20th Party Congress. And all this was in the run-up, the you know jettisoning Deng Xiaoping, shaking hands with Mao to the 20th Party Congress, two and a half years of COVID. A hard yank to the left, complete militarism. This is also the time when he undertook his exercise, adventurism across the LAC. And everyone thought that China was now going to rule the world and it was a Sinocentric world order. And he had sealed his third term, a switch. Now, in the 20th Party Congress, he did another flip. The flip was his emphasis on security and technology. And security still rules, whether it's internal security or external security. We have analyzed this budget in the two sessions where he said the, the internal security budget was more than the external security budget and everything is security oriented. And it is now very clear that all his actions during COVID were enhancing security to the extent that privacy in normal life was also finished. Okay. And today he wants to become the highest. He feels a threat. Uh, you know, he feels a threat to whatever is happening because the economy has started spluttering. Now he wants to look at privatization, food security, and he switched back to coal-based energy. I see someone saying that he's deranged. He's not deranged. He's very clear what he's doing, except that he never came with a clear thought. And he never stuck to it. I'm reminded of someone in USA who said, who was with him in a bank way, who spoke with him. And he said, I found him to be a dull man. Everyone in China thought he will be amenable to whatever they tell him. But he was a real guy who hid his strength and bided his time. When it came, he started doing what he wanted. Now he's going back to the first square. It's like a snake and ladder thing. Now, an economy like China, a huge nation like China, if every second day this thing happens, what happens? Okay, well, I'll give an analogy. The way I look at China today, I see it as equivalent to India in the late 80s, 90s, early 90s. We had a lot of Kichdi governments. We had two phases of HD governments. Every year, everyone would change and the policies would change. Nothing was going wrong, right? And we had to hawk our gold in Bank of England. Same. In the past three to four years, the amount of policy changes that Xi Jinping has brought about reminds me of that. If you turn a huge country like China, 
we are ruining it we were ruined by different governments here china is being ruined by the same government or the same man with different policies okay so this is what xi jinping has done he has brought china to where it is but is he the guy who's done it alone it's not so i don't think so it's a system it's a systemic failure which has happened in uh, in china okay now look at it look at uh, uh, chinese gdp over time right uh, this gdp had actually you know when 2012 was when uh, xi jinping took power the peak was somewhere in 2007 2008 after the world financial crisis it recovered and then it started going down and everyone knew that it is going to go down because there were systemic flaws in the chinese economy xi jinping's time it just kept sliding down right and i'll get back to this later and this was known and xi jinping did nothing about it he could he do something about it he could have done lot but he hastened this down trend with his flips okay now in the process what has happened china is a country which is indebted from any direction you see you see the countries which are indebted to china they are all part of the south the global south poor countries they might owe hell of a lot to china sovereign debt but they will not be able to pay back china can keep rolling over loans and loans and the debt can keep accumulating china will get nothing out of it financially it will get nothing it might get lot of votes in un it might get lot of global power everything but no but then in many of these countries the governments have changed and the changed governments are having second thoughts about china sri lanka is the later i mean the nearest example but that equally happening in angola angola was supposed to be the jewel in the crown of the chinese empire at a time there were nearly 3 lakh people in angola today there are less than 10000 and you can see many more countries who are now struggling with china and their debt you forget about their struggle china won't get anything out of that so that's dead loss so if it is dead loss and you have become unpopular in these countries right you can't expand your trade there if you can't expand your trade there you have fought with other countries where will your exports go and you are a export dependent country which is not transformed as simple as that okay now you look at the household debt i spoke of this household debt some time back i think either the imf or world bank it said 65% is the limit of household debt they are already peaking there you see the rise in the household debt in china if this is the amount of household debt in china who will buy anything and china has to consume and the fact that china has to consume was not a revelation of day before yesterday you see the household debt which was there it is underlying somewhere around 2004 5 it peaked and it is continuing and going up you can be in debt if you have a consistent income income stream then you can be in debt no problems but your exports are gone jobs are gone how can you be in debt and what is this debt all about it's about housing because 70% of uh, savings of people is in housing and that housing property is gone down the valuation has gone down so people are in debt with no value they can't sell to you know square off their debt and they don't have money to repay the mortgages how will china consume zero 
so they can't they won't come out of the scrap in a hurry what is there to do right let's look at chinese cities are in buried in debt but they keep shoveling it on is what new york times wrote but 6 months back they are building more roads railways industrial parks even though the economic returns on that activity are increasingly meager in their struggle to find the money to fund their new projects and the interest payments on their old ones cities are cutting public services and benefits that's the trick you build roads you build everything you're not getting returns from that in in lieu in some places bus services are not are packed up or in some places some uh, trains have been stopped something 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 x y z and and this has been going on for the past 6 months to 1 year if you put the whole picture what is coming out is something different it is just not debt it is not youth it is not one it is not two it is not three it is the 1.4 billion which makes china okay despite all this this is their problem china bets 1.8 trillion of construction will boost their economy and this headline is just about maybe one month two months old the government is continuing to rely on its old playbook of driving up investment non productive investment they are trying to free up real estate real estate you do what you want the biggest of them all ever grand two years old it's still going down and down and down now country garden has joined it's as big as uh, uh, you know ever grand Mr. Shekhar Gupta finally woke up and said, "Right, I should do a, a article. I mean, you know, cut the clutter on that." And he said, "He said very logical stuff. There's no doubt about it." But we saw all this long back. I've spoken of it. In fact, I've said the BRI and their property, right, are the two. What shall I say? Uh, Ponzi's of China. Twin Ponzi's of China. I've written an article in the Sunday Guardian about this one year back. right now debt pressure will improve as ri- uh, provinces spend more and more high speed rail capacity has been underutilized ghost cities are endemic canals and water transfer projects are unsustainable which are explained in the can- uh, climate change issue now what does this why how are they funding all this this entire debt is being securitized and given to people and sold as bonds high coupon bonds where they get high interest they may might pay interest but the bonds are never going to be redeemed one day they won't pay interest like country garden has stopped paying interest for the past uh, two tranches of dollar denominated bonds international you don't pay them up it's going to collapse so your trust factor goes and business it's all about trust so if this is going to happen who is going to be left holding the bucket or the candle in my way of looking at it it's going to be the common chinese if the chinese are going to get poorer they are not going to consume at all and i have explained this whole story of this consumption racket or rather the uh, securitization of racket and all in one of my earlier episodes of peak into everyday china how they are being securitized and you know how people are paying for it if there's a scam it is this okay this came in bloomberg last year july 21 i just put the headline when will china rule the world maybe never the communist party wants the world to see china's continued rise as inevitable in reality it's anything but we missed it we said no oh, everyone can it's a red herring has china already peaked this was in nikki asia 2021 i'm talking two years back this is paul krugman nobel prize laureate is china in big trouble same time new york times 
it's only that people were very worried of putting their finger and saying china will collapse and let's start treating china differently okay pussy footing around ab to mar raha kya karega what was paul krugman's view then i'm talk not now at that time 2021 it very significant yet the more closely you look at china at how china has been able to keep its economy going the more problematic it looks basically china has masked underlying imbalances by creating an immense housing bubble and it's hard to see how this ends well i agree with i agreed with him then i agree with him now i in fact quoted him in some of my articles i i i keep this article safely with me i have already found pointed out that until now china has been able to defy the doomsdayers so you might be tempted to give chinese policy makers the benefit of doubt and assume they'll manage to deal with this situation it turns out however that they haven't really been dealing with their economy's underlying problems and they've been masking those problems by creating a housing bubble that will ultimately magnify the problem again prophetic when we don't look at the fundamentals we can keep dreaming about the dragon okay i don't even call it a dragon it's a pretty sick lizard today okay in fact i've written an article is it a chinese dragon or a sick lizard and my view is it's a sick lizard i hope it makes a good shot out of this you know and let me try okay now i'll come to Ma- michael petters and his five paths again these were all old 2021 22 it's not new i i discussed that i put it out in a video and this i put out four incidentally i put out four links for four videos in this description all four have links to this whole story which i'm talking of because they're all interconnected you want to know what i've spoken and you want elucidation on that go to that if you want further elucidation go into my videos on peak into everyday china and look at specific subjects and you'll get the story the latest ones preferably okay what does michael petters say okay he says china can stay on its current path and keep letting large amounts of non productive investment continue driving the country's debt burden up indefinitely that is do nothing chalte bano china can reduce the large amount of non productive investment on which it relies to drive growth and replace it with productive infra- investment in forms of like new technology so productive investment has to come through new technology and that's what xi jinping is trying technology i showed you unfortunately that technology is not on a good wicket and usa is after all usa has also read michael petters you go technology deny kar do china will be in a fix because it doesn't have its own technology and whatever technology it has is shaky china can reduce the large amount of non productive investment on which it relies to drive growth and replace it with rising consumption so move it into a consumption driven economy that's what they're trying but no one's consuming july the whole thing is crashing even further china can reduce the large amount of non productive investment on which it relies to drive growth and replace it with a growing trade surplus so you have to export manufacturing bri diplomacy so what he is doing is he is trying to hold the manufacturing base through the bri and diplomacy diplomacy with middle east iran south africa brics shanghai cooperation organization xyz and india so that the export is going on and manufacturing is propped up in fact is they are trying all three and not succeeding the last is china can reduce the large amount of non productive investment on which it relies to drive growth and replace it with nothing that means it means contraction of gdp will it be possible it's politically not possible so hence 
Xi Jinping is trying technology, consumption, and diplomacy, manufacturing. These are the three things. Right, let's see a little further. Michael Pettis later said he converted it into three you know, pathways, and I have modified it and put it. So the first is the common prosperity path. It's interesting how common prosperity is part of consumer. So, uh, surge in consume, consumption growth to replace investment growth. That's his path. China needs to transfer 2% of GDP every year from local governments and the rich. From local governments and the rich, take it, transfer it to ordinary households. Every year for, of two, that is 2% of GDP. That's the common prosperity. Take it from the rich and give it to the poor. And this has to be done for about 8 to 10 years before you re get back to 6-7% growth rate. Now, the moment you talk of con uh, consumption growth through common prosperity, it has backfired. So today, no one talks of common prosperity. One year back, he was talking of it. So common prosperity had an underlying economic sense. Take money from where it is surplus. And he was also aiming, I mean, to be fair to him, he was also aiming at the wide inequality between in the super rich in China and the poor in China. 850 million people were on around lower middle class level, despite everything. 850 million is quite a bit. It's 80, 70 to 80 percent of Chinese population. If they had to start consuming, they had to be given money. And that money had to come from the richer people, the enormously rich people. But the enormously rich people would not give it to the poor people because they felt threatened by what Xi Jinping did to Alibaba or for that Tencent and whatever. So they started taking money out. People, it is documented that people have invested in USA, Malaysia, Singapore, anywhere else, Australia, anywhere else. They said, we, what money we've had, we've had, we'll, let's go. Now, if those high net worth individuals go out of your system, We'll make money for you here and privatize, which is the order of the day today. That's gone. The money is gone. The talent is gone. And the people are still poor. And common prosperity is a tough word which is not going to be implemented. So that's gone. In between path, I call it a sharp slowdown in GDP, which is probably happening now. Now, in this, he says, maintain consumption growth at roughly 3 to 4% with moderate investment. A little bit of investment because investment will, uh, you know, create jobs. Jobs will create everything X, Y, Z. But that is 3 to 4% consumption growth, which is not happening. It's not been happening for the past one year. Right. Annual, in this case, annual GDP would drop to roughly 2%. That's what's happening today. So at 2%, where will China become a superpower? He'll continue like this and he'll continue to decline. Okay. Then there's a depression path. That's the third, the, you know, in this alternative, there's the fifth, there's a fifth alternative, which I said, do nothing. Depression path. Why I call it depression path, I'll come. I call it a depression path because it approximates to what has happened in USA in 1930s during the Great Depression. He says, what is a depression path? A very sharp, short-term contraction in GDP in which investment contracts far more sharply than household income and consumption. Okay. This is, for example, how the US rebalanced its economy in the 1930s. But while this form of adjustment tends to be more economically efficient over the longer term, it is usually a chaotic and politically disruptive process. And in China, it will be catastrophic. A capitalistic society like China, USA could do this. People, property lost value overnight in the 30s, if you read the book of that day. You read a book called by John Steinbeck, right? uh, East of Eden, and uh, what is that? Sour of the Grapes or something like that. I rem I'm forgetting. The Sour Grapes of Horrible stories of depression. 
but if you do that and somehow you manage to increase consumption over the long term you'll do but it's difficult so all these three paths are virtually not available any path you take any path any path recovery happens will take over 6 to 10 years this is not going to overnight you know like some slick economist comes to you and so oh, i lived in china china is going to revitalize in the next you know next quarter they'll take uh, gdp up to 8% 10% it's not going to happen it's just not going to happen the vibes you're getting from china are horrid okay it's a nation which has lost confidence Re really speaking the people have lost confidence and we when people lose confidence you can get any one it doesn't matter okay so any of these paths is not possible if it is feasible it will still take 8 to 10 years for china to get back to level it's going to go down whether you like it or not you can't stop it and remember newton's law what goes up has to come down from law but a clear and if it goes faster it will come down faster and law of inertia when momentum starts on a particular direction it will continue till an external force comes and alters that china's momentum was on upward swing till the external force came the external force which which came was reach and pick that external force has changed direction with all the zigzags it's gone down that external force till that external force goes away china cannot revert but then china can't revert for many other reasons we'll come to that okay a lot of predictions have been given about china economy this that i found this the most interesting this is by the japanese council of Ex economic research and they put it out i think about 6 months back or 8 months back it was very interesting it's just a one page or two page sheet as per them in 2020 their forecast 2020 at the beginning of covid their forecast was that the us economy will cross the japanese economy around 25 30 which all of us thought so in 2021 their forecast was it would cross around 2035 but in 22 their forecast is it will never cross it's going to go parallel to the us economy but this was one year back but today it is even worse right and their growth rates up to 2036 is this their predicted growth rates in under risk and not under risk it's not very different so if in the next three up to 2030 you they don't see growth happening and the conditions for growth are not there how will China recover? I would just think. Okay. This is the latest article, 2023, August 2, 2023. The end of China's economic miracle. This was discussed by many people, including Michael Pettis, including John uh, Paul Krugman. They've commented on this article. Adam Poson. Is supposed to be uh, another heavyweight economist of some international economic organization. I don't know which, I don't remember. But the article is interesting. You must read it. You must read it in foreign affairs. Very clear, he says, it's the end of China's economic miracle. But what struck me most in that, you know, uh, is this graph. This graph indicates where, you know, have a look. Household savings have surged. How they've gone up. That red line. People are just holding on to money. People's savings have gone up since there is uncertainty and lack of trust. People don't know whether they'll get the next meal. Remember, China has a problem. China has a psychological problem. The, the psychological problem of China is that they have gone through cycles of famines. And they're worried about food. Always. They don't, they're just, Chinese are just holding on to money. There's a lot of talk, give stimulus, give stimulus, give stimulus. If I am in debt and I 
I'm not sure of my job tomorrow. I'm not sure about my earnings tomorrow. I get debt. I'll hold on to it. I, if I get, I get a stimulus from the government, I'll immediately repay whatever debt I have and I'll hold on to my savings, whatever I have. Because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Whatever is happening in China is exactly the antithesis of what's happening in the rest of the world. I mean, just think, China inflation is going down. The interest rates are going down. Soon they'll come a stage where money will be freely available from banks. Whereas in the rest of the countries, the inflation is going up, interest rates are going up. Why? Deflation is set in in China. Why? Confidence of people. The American system or the Indian system or the British system, they are not so bothered about inflation. They say, let's hike the bank rates, cool the system down. Even if a bit of high inflation is there, it's good. 4 to 5% inflation has always been good for any economy as per what I learned long back. But you are here in the deflation. And they're hiding figures. Look, forget about what China does. I'm now going by established figures, mostly by the Chinese guys. And that gives you an indication of actually what's happening. Okay. Now, what are the other constituents in this graph? They are more interesting, actually. Have a look at it. The black one is durable goods consumption. It's been going down consistently. Private fixed Asset investment. See that gray one. You know, you know, if there is something to dig and go underground, it will. No one is investing. The private people are not investing. Unless your private economy starts re kicking back into the system, it's not going to happen. Okay. That's the problem. No one is interested in investing in China. There's no investment. FDI is uh, dropped. I can follow it up with a lot of graphs and all, but Take it from me, it's there. And in any case, sometime later, I'll follow it up with another peek into everyday China. Well, I'll substantiate whatever I said this there with facts and figures. Okay. In this article, Adam Person has said this, and I go by it. Right? That's why I picked it out. China's decline will be gradual. Mark that word. It's already grown big. It can't suddenly deflate. You're talking of 1.4 million people or 1.2 million people, whatever that figure is. It's a huge uh, lot of people. It will be so they will, whatever they do, even if they do normal eating, their economy will keep running. The wheels of the economy will keep turning. Right? Their decline will be gradual. It will remain the world's second or third largest economy for decades to come. I have no doubt. The weight of that economy will be there. It will be obese country. But the huge gap between its waning demographic and economic strength and its expanding political ambitions may make it highly vulnerable to strategic misjudgments. This is the danger. On one side, your economic strength is going down and your demography is going down on which we'll talk of. On the other side, politically, your ambitions are you still want to be a superpower. The gap between the two, if Xi Jinping and this company jump, you're looking at war. You're looking at a major configuration. Right. Uh, what else does it say? Yeah, memories of the past glory or fear of lost status could lead it down the same dangerous path that Russia has taken in Ukraine. That's He's talking of war. So China's leader should le heed the lessons of Russia's burst invasion and wake up from their unrealistic Chinese dream of natural national rejuvenation. Of course, you read about any you read any American author today. He is a party man for America's uh, support to Russia, uh, Ukraine, and against Russia. But that's a little, you know, uh, uh, their own bent of mind. You leave that out. The fundamentals of this article are very clear. Of course, uh, Michael Pettis and um, Paul Krugman don't agree with him completely, but they say he's what he's talking is fundamentally right. I've taken these three. We could have taken. I could have taken more, but I, the discussion would have been too long. Okay. Now I've spoken of China's climate trap. There's a full video I've said. China is 
going to be affected by climate change and it's going to be badly affected why this droughts and floods have been endemic to china from time immemorial many chinese dynasties have collapsed due to drought famines and floods like i said this is last year's slide when the drought was on the current drought is more extensive and severe anyway if you go into this video which i did it again reference in my uh, description in depth i have discussed that china is at great risk to climate change much more than us or for that matter most countries my way of looking at it if you go into full detail it is uh, china and europe which are going to get most affected so what are they going to get affected water food energy and semiconductors and their dream of semiconductor because for semiconductor you need water water food and energy are there at great risk and we'll talk of energy a bit but food i've discussed i energy also have discussed in this climate change business in this video on climate change have a look at it i've given the reference to it if you see these four five videos which i put out you will see a very dark and a dismal picture of china coming out you know holistic okay now electricity is necessary for all productive activities there no doubt you need bijli why what our people said sadak bijli pani sadak to ban gaya bijli hai nahi pani ka killat hai hindi mein bol raha hu main thoda bahut जो इंटरनेशनल लोग ये सुन रहे हैं इट इज वॉटर रोड एंड इलेक्ट्रिसिटी सड़क पानी बिजली ओके नो इलेक्ट्रिसिटी यूज कंजम्पन ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिटी इलेक्ट्रिसिटी हैज जनरली आउटस्ट्रिप इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ इन चाइना दिस इज अ फैक्ट एंड दिस इज अ न्यूयॉर्क टाइम्स एनालिसिस electricity use has generally grown faster than the gdp economic growth can be inferred from electricity consumption mathematically if the overall economy were to grow at 10% annually and 70% of the economy that is based in rural areas were not growing as stated by the chinese government the economy in chinese cities would have to grow by 13% 33% a year the urban economy is growing rapidly but not at 33% that's the story you <laughs> there is no way china is going to grow at the astronomical rates which we thought because they don't have electricity last year there were electricity cuts in southern china in chongqing and yunnan and all uh, they had to get coal and all that people lost electricity and yeah you look at this china pumps out coal plants and increasing pace to allay security fears risking climate change transition so they have got back to coal based energy so if they have got back to coal based energy in a big manner and xi jinping has told the mr john curry who is the climate ambassador who went there uh, to china recently xi jinping told him sorry we will go come uh, you know sort out our climate the way we want when we want if that is what he is doing he is burning coal more if he is burning coal more you go back to the 2030 report which i spoke in the beginning climate change and pollution so he is going back he is turning the clock back beautifully and if china doesn't have electricity they are not going to produce if they don't produce whatever is there that also will go down actually china has come to a optimum level of Uh, able being able to produce electricity it's water water it's anyway it is down and food why is china going to space why is china want want thorium why does it talk of artificial sun etc etc all this is the search for energy which it needs if it doesn't have energy it's gone i mean let the same applies to everyone even for us and we don't learn from china we are also up that creek with a without a paddle
So, the fact is, will, will China be able to tide over all this? It's difficult because, you know, you can invest in space-based energy. It won't generate jobs. You have, it's just investment till you get energy, which is risky. All this moon travel and all to get water, water, they say, is the oil of space. Is for what? I said, it is for energy. If you can get hydrogen, tritium, deuterium, and then you do nuclear fission, or you get some kind of thing, then you get energy here. Or you do thorium. Thorium, oh, oh, that I'll talk a little later. Uh, two, three days later, how people are, they are fooling themselves with thorium. Or rather, they're trying to show India down through their uh, progress in thorium. That I'll talk later. So they don't have energy. So, where is the manufacturing? Where is the investment going? Right. What is the state of China's food security drive and what must be done to feed its people? I did an extensive video on food insecurity in China and a peek into everyday China. I've given a reference of this in my description. Have a look at it. Please. I mean, if you're serious, so many people today are watching this uh, video. You must watch those three, four videos which I put. And then if you're still not convinced, go to the others. China is at risk. It might not be happy today. It might be tomorrow, day after. Just today evening, I saw Peter Zihan's prediction about Yellow River and how it's going to be the sorrow of China ultimately, like it has been for the past 2,500 years. If that, if Peter Zihan's Prediction comes even 10% true, he's talking 100% than what I am predicting. That's the that's the difference in you know my thinking and his thinking. Okay. Now food is this thing. Now you as China quotes go global partnership, it must bridge the trust gap. The thing is about not global partnership, revival, and all trust. Who trusts China? I don't trust China, India doesn't trust China. In all my articles, in all my talks, in all my this thing for the past three years, after 2020, China has alienated the largest nation on earth with the largest population. There is not a single guy in, China, in India who says, let's go with China. Okay. USA to khatti hai. Europe ke saath khatti hai. Ye paisa wale hai yehi hai. Bhai, Japan ke saath yeh khatti. So you are not... You are periphery, you are at odds. No one trusts you. No one trusts you because what you did to them in COVID. No, all the people who with whom you are given debt, they don't trust you. They might vote for you under duress, but they don't tr trust you. So China has created a huge trust gap. If this huge trust gap is there, how will things move up? So it's a matter of thinking. But the biggest and the, the weakest edict of China or edifice of China in that wall, in the dream, China's rejuvenation dream using military technology and diplomacy is this. Old people going up, young people coming down. This is a very nice, uh, you know, comic. It tells China's problem, demography. This is the standard thing you will see, that China's demography is going to go down. But I'm not interested in that. Interesting. The left graph shows the peak of China's working age population. It peaked around 2010-12. And you see it correlates with the economy. The economy and the working age population, as the working age population has started reducing, the economy has started reducing. So if the working age population has to reduce further, logically the economy also has to go down, whether you like it or not. I mean, you can put any theory, but, but and if you compound all this, whatever this normal thinking, common sense thinking, with what all I have said so far, then the picture is even more bleak, and that's what's happening out Right. So I said, let me look at the population, you know, in a little more 
detailed manner because that gives you a actual holistic view everyone talks of population 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 what will happen for the population so i took this graph this is graph is a un graph okay let me be very clear uh, i have the authority also for it there's no problem i picked it off the un charts this is the thing blue is for 25 to 64 that's the working age population 0 to 14 is the baby population 15 to 24 is those that population which is also considered working age population in many countries so i take it as that and the purple one is the 65 plus old age group everything is going down first if you notice okay so let's i did a little bit of jugglery with this what did i do i you know, put, I said, look, let me look at it in 2023. Okay. That's the current line, blue line, vertical line. 2025, that's a red line. Sorry, 2030, that's a red line. 2040, that's a green line. And 2050, that's a brown line. And I converted it into respective populations in various age groups. So this is the table which comes out. 0 to 14. In 23, you have 240 million, 2020, 180 million, 2040, 140 million, and 2050, 140 million. It will stabilize. 15 to 24 goes from 160 to 165. It increases in this age group. Goes down to 130, then 100. 25 to 64 age group from 820 million today to 800 million to 725 million to 660 million. And this is still 2050, right? 65 plus, the old age party. Today it is 190. It's going to 250 by 2030. In six years, seven years, we're going to increase 60 million. We'll talk of these percentages a little later. Then it goes, jumps to 360, and then it stabilizes at about 395. Total, today, one, 141 goes to... It, st it still is there to 1405, goes down to 1355, goes down to 1295. Okay, let's analyze this a little in detail because this doesn't tell you anything. So what did I do? I, in the first top chart, you see plus minus in red. In the bottom chart, what I did was I flipped and, you know, uh, the chart. 0 to 14 and 65. These are the people who are going to be dependent on the working age population. So I took them on the top and brought the working age population, which is 15 to 24 and 25 to 64 down below. So you get a better idea. And then went through, right. Now you look at this. If you see the 23 and 30, okay, there's no major effect till 23, 30 because the green, that is green bands, that is population who are dependent, right, are almost the same. Dependency, that means the same number of people will, you know, the same number of dependents will be there. But what up and, but there'll be a slight decrease in the bottom, working age population, 15 to 24 and 25 to 64. Between 2030 and 2023 uh, and 30, you'll have less 5 million, minor. So, there'll be not much population effect as far as uh, you know, till 2030. But the other things are there, other problems are there. But in, in this itself, there are certain problems. What is the problem? Look at the 65 plus age group. The 65 plus, plus age group, which is today 190 million, goes up to 250 million. It will increase from 13.74% to 17.8. Now, if you look at it even further, the 60 plus age group, right, that increases from 18% to 23%. And if you look at it in 2030, right, it works out to 25% of the population of China will be 60 plus. So that is the number of people who are gone out and who have to be supported and have to be depended on. Okay, we'll come to the other rest later. Okay, now if you go further, you go further to 2040. Okay, what happens in, by 2040? You see the dependency rates that in the first two columns, that's a green band, right? Where from 430 million in 2030, it goes up to 500. Now, what does that mean? 
and your population has gone down from 1405 to 1355 that's the bottom row it means the dependency ratio will increase from 1 is to 1 2.26 to 1 is to 1.17 what is this uh, let me explain 2. Point, today by 2030 there would have been two and a half people who support one old dependent either he is an infant or an old man okay by 2040 1.7 people will have to do that. And if you take the 65 plus into this thing, it will be 1.5. 60 plus, sorry. 60 plus means it will be 1.5. So every for every five people, you will have three young people and two, uh, sorry, three working people and two non-working people. That's the kind of a problem they're going to decline. They're going to have between 2030 and 40. Okay. Total population, if you see between 2030 and 40, which is the last line, from 1405, it goes down to 1355. They are going to lose 55 million people or 50 million people, whichever you look at it. 65 age group will grow from 17% to 26% in this. 60% age group, 60 plus age group, will increase from 23% to 31%. One in three people in China by 2040 will be plus 60, 60 plus. Who will work in the fields? Even if you increase the retirement ages, the productivity of a young chap is far more than the old guy. His thinking power is different. Even today, people over 35 are not getting jobs in China. This is it. Their demographic decline from 2030 to 2040 is so sharp, so sharp that you cannot imagine. Until 2030, there's no chance of a recovery. After that, it will be a precise. They're going to go off the cliff. There's no question of any increase. Who will go into the forge? Who will go into the army? I mean, if someone thinks with these kind of figures that China is going to recover, and China has got a long-term view. I've given my long-term view till 2040. Disprove me. I doubt. Then, this is an article which I saw two days back. China's population 2023 births could plunge by a quarter from record low less set last year. Some academic has won. He's done some survey. What does he say? Births in China will be between 7 to 8 million births only. Last year, it was ni some 9.63 million births. So they're going to lose 2 million babies. If 2 million babies they lose here, okay, go back to this. What will be the effect on these in 7 years? I'm talking only till 2030. In 7 years, they would have lost 14 million more population. Then this whole story will become even more inverted. If this is true this year, China has to be in absolute panic. We'll see when they come out with the birth figures and all that. But in a close country like China, no one will put out this kind of an article without some official thing. He's see the first line. After demographic alarms went out when Chinese mother had fewer than 10 million children, how critical will the situation become if only 7 million are born this year? Peking University Medical Dean also says more must be done to boost firm female fertility with greater investments needed to increase research into disease prevention for women and children. That has not been done in China from I don't know when. And they have the lowest fertility rate, which is compounded. See, the problem with the uh, country like China is it keeps lying. But someday the lies will fall flat. Okay. Right. So this is what it is. So this whole figures are going to go even more skewed. If that goes happens, I mean, I don't know. I will be, we'll be able to make some thing when we get those figures. And then you'll see China running all around the countryside. Already you see a lot of articles on aging and health. And etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, but which I'll substantiate down the line. It's not a new thing. Okay. 
this is paul krugman's article a few days back he says why is china's article stumbling why is china's economy stumbling he's got i'm getting back to economy now right what does he say in this while the actions of xi jinping have indeed been erratic i am in the camp of economists like michael petters he goes with michael petters theory right who sees the country's problem as more systemic he feels the systemic problems of china are more uh, problematic than what xi jinping is doing i feel they are both equal uh, adam possen feels it's because of xi jinping but whichever way you take section average you average the whole thing out both are bad now china's rulers have relied on economic achievement to give them legitimacy this is where the political angle comes in the internal problems now they are facing trouble on the home front it and it will compound as we do, go by most most immediately in the form of rapidly rising youth employment how will they respond i have already done a uh, you know a program on youth unemployment with the help of op jindal team that's also referred to in the descriptions have a look at it three young people researchers have given their views on the youth and employment have a look at it you will understand what i'm talking and there's no solution to it and then then he further goes out and says you don't have to study much history to be aware that autocratic regimes sometimes respond to domestic difficulties by trying to distract the population with foreign adventurism that's the risk and that's the risk india faces and why i'll come to it a little later china's domestic problems make it more not less of a danger to global security china today is an outlier on this issue like i said earlier its economy is going down when others inflation is going up interest rates in china are again they cut it two days back surprise right please take it but no one is interested in taking it this is today's Cha- halting jo- uh, halting youth unemployment data criticized as counterproductive worsening transfer what what the whole thing is china unemployment is very weak and employment figures of youth so what these people have done is they stop putting out the figures they said we're going to correct it so now we don't know there's no transparency on what the story is which makes it even worse which means the thing is actually even worse whatever all this data everything all this analysis which i have done which i have been doing it's a long video i'm sorry but it demands so uh is based on published data if you take out the lies and you take out the chinese overstatement then the situation is even worse okay today as of today all the chinese leaders are at this place called bedahai where the chinese leaders and their apex people and the old people and their experienced party members all meet and this is what nikki asia says uh, z opens bedahai with no elders but plenty of challenges yeah i agree with him I, there are a lot of challenges z, z has got but do they have answers i don't see okay let me go back to something which i wrote again in the daily guardian right this was in july 2020 i had spoken about the middle aged kingdoms kingdoms last gambit 3 years back i spoke of a middle aged kingdom kingdom and its last gambit part of its last gambit at that time was attacking india i mean you have to re- if you read china for a long time you then start understanding it and what did i write then i want to reproduce it because it's valid today i had written postulates for india in that i had written if china declines india must rise so it is in india's interest that an aging china declines this is what i wrote this is my interest but i said aging china will decline prepare and act accordingly have we done that we have done that to a large extent we need to do more 
the odd finger at pangong so is irrelevant think beyond that that's what i wrote then when they were sitting at the ping, finger at pangong so what will i if what i have to say today i will say don't worry about that song don't worry about them chalk they are irrelevant they are some pieces of territory look at the bigger picture then i have written india rises despite setbacks and chaos this is a history virus china pakistan floods earthquakes at all affect india but cannot stop it i still feel so i have written about it i put out a video about it india uh, underestimates its greatest strengths diversity vitality soft power democracy assimilation and trust and these are all coming to the front manipur is in a bad shape but we'll get over it i am very confident the people of india will sort the politics out don't worry it doesn't matter if my response comes from a bjp chap or a congress guy or a communist or a dmk guy i am not bothered he's a indian we will sort everyone out we the people along with the government it doesn't matter which government today there it's a fancy to say nehru's government was bad or indira gandhi's government was bad rajiv gandhi's government was bad and only vajpayee's government was good and narendra modi's government is the best history will tell us that but we as indians we have to cooperate with our government we can't fight with our government irrespective of what the government is only then the government will go ahead we can criticize the government that's our right democratic right but we must be with it to make it go ahead in the government doing well lies or doing well i am talking apolitically and if you look at it all our governments have done well some governments have done better than the others but so be it right and the last postulate which i had given at that point of time was that the indian armed forces are strong enough to hold china at bay to let india grow that's what indian armed forces have done for all these years if they are strengthened india will grow faster respond accordingly if you want india to become a power a global power right the armed forces of india have to be far more stronger technologically and from all other points of view if we put these things together i i have no thing right this is where i uh, yeah finish today's talk it's been a long talk i know a lot of people have been are attending i'm grateful to all of you uh the last thing i'll say again the first uh you know uh, thing which i showed china is depending on its military technology it, it's on military technology and diplomacy and it's depending or rather it is a very shaky edifice on which it is standing because every other parameter on the which it wants to build its uh, diplomacy i let me get that slide one minute uh, i'll go through questions i know it's a long session but i'll go through all your questions and i'll put out uh, this later again or oh, there's some problem i can't right so china is standing on a shaky edifice demography and climate change are its worst enemies the rest of the economy is in like a jelly okay so where this goes i don't know and this demography is going to go downhill after 30 there's no doubt till 30 there's no recovery great recovery likely to happen it might stabilize and we got to contend with this behemoth who aims for something which it cannot achieve and it's going to trouble us and how we respond to it is what uh, we have to really think of and we'll talk of it coming down the line so i'll take on a few questions i might not take on all questions because of time but let me go through the supers first uh, pranam general shankar you have been the first person to make us realize that china is not that big as it is portrayed even people of our armed forces 
subscribe to the media narrative the media narrative goes by what the chinese narrative is all about unfortunately i don't fall for it and i've not i've gone back to 2020 but my initial articles i started writing in 2017 why 2017 was when i started writing i retired in 2016 and i started writing in 2017 well i have been studying china my first presentation on china was given way back when i was a major in 91 i'm very clear about what i'm talking okay uh right latia pachpan harkate bachpan thanks a lot for your contribution and then what i saw a couple more then i will get to the questions right aditya thanks a lot again uh jb jp also thanks how many hours of research you did for this show i've been developing this for almost two weeks in between i did four more shows right i've been slowly accumulating i'll have to substantiate this with a few others down the line but i will look i did i i didn't have to do research really it was just collecting thoughts and putting things together that's about all oh uh, you should call saurav jha i don't know who's who is he quantum physics karenge kisi din saurav jha takes forever <laughs> Oh, yeah okay i don't know i mean i don't know saurav jha so i don't want to comment on him john doe is better zinc ping is lucky and great friend of yeah i like yeah, i ye pankaj aapne sahi bola hai zi chin ping and imran khan were the two best friends of india i it's a pity that imran khan is in jail i hope they don't put zi chin ping in jail um a drowning deranged zi chin ping could be more di- dangerous to taiwan i'll not put it this way uh, i think we need to be take care of uh, we need to take care of it he is not deranged he is quite calculative china is still growing at about 5% which is only a few percent rohan i think you have to change your thinking and that's about all very insightful sir rajiv coming from you it's a great compliment i have no doubt about it thanks a lot when rajiv narayanan my good friend and a person whom i consider is a real authority on china it gives this it i think uh, that's the best super i've got for the day uh thanks we are learning from your channel all the best thanks a lot jay shri ram good evening rajiv sir that's great uh, gana shoot like the button ask questions later yeah <laughs> i'll i'll go through all no problem no one except said trump said anything about corona fine tarun John Doe, XGP is using fear, anxiety of war as a bargaining chip internally as well as externally. Internally, it allows more draconian restrictions. Externally, it keeps yeah that uh, is there. He knows his military isn't ready for any conflict. As a result, we won't have any. I'll analyze uh, the Chinese military from a different perspective, and I'll do this analysis along with General Rajiv Narayanan. one of these days so that you know he has written this book on uh, the, uh, on china's army and pla uh, right will the dragon's bite which we did discuss two more chinese giant companies in trouble real estate from garden country garden and saving trust yeah i agree with you total trouble uh please invite guru murthy sorry i don't even know him so i don't have confidence in him so i don't want to call him what is the idea of china reis being inevitable as accepted as common knowledge pre covid clearly the problems it's facing today with we did long ago which we chose to ignore why did we not see it people were dazzled people were just simply dazzled people refused to accept and people were making money all the wall street guys everyone were dumping money into china and making money so uh, that's how it is okay in last who will take over china we'll see that i don't right uh with china collapse dramatically i don't see it collapsing because the num- amount of population which is there it will not collapse so easily you have to realize one thing till about 6 Till till about eighteen nineteen, 
the chinese people implicitly trusted the ccp even now they trust the ccp they feel that the ccp will pull them out it won't happen is a different thing by the time they realize it won't happen you will be knocking around 2026 27 by then it will be too late but problems have started and it will only compound right it's a it's going to be slow compound it's it going to build up slowly not going to be sudden collapse india today conclave is where i saw gurumurthy is interesting yeah i have heard him he is a wacky character kind of a guy shekhar gupta once commented recently on india china trade that india is like the colony of china in trade with respect i look i don't want to call sign gupta as a sinophile uh, he uh, let let me very clear he is just a journalist with a with a clear analysis of what he is good at and one thing is not good at is china one thing most of us are not good at is china because we go we have gone by what they have put out and we have gone by what the economists have put out if you analyze china the way you know different way well this is what comes out uh yeah hello purane rohan indra as why so given must have been seeded yeah yeah these are all lo- seeded long back okay uh okay i'll now start uh anand says yeah 13000 subscribers yeah that was quite a jump that was thanks to jaipur dialogues i went there and they started speaking a lot of people came so again when i go and speak on jaipur dialogues more people will come unless you people help me if you people help me i'll be okay is the word irrevocable too big to see no verdict on china but as you said yes yeah long ago a majority of one is predicting china <laughs> i might be right i might not be right but let me make a guess at best it might be whatever it is but it's the recovery is irrevocable i have to stick to it i might be wrong so what if yeah i agree akash they are uh, saying sushila sharma thanks a lot madam um yeah shri jinping is responsible for all the economic troubles of china that you underlined or exposed this then is a political coup against shri jinping no it is very difficult because he is emasculated all opposition chinese company byd cars are being imported no it's not it's been it's been uh, stopped okay it's been stopped uh china four to five times our state gdp it's very difficult to comprehend their lower level of consumption something seems amiss their state of their gdp like i said is non productive gdp dead gdp their infrastructure is dead gdp it doesn't consume anything anymore outflow of investments is very high yeah south africa is very rich in minerals oil gold economy etc etc india must concentrate on... <laughs> look south africa has got severe problems we should not go and unnecessarily start fingering around there we need to invest on africa look don't talk of africa isolated see that video which i have done with um, the good old a good ambassador to au uh, mr uh, gurjeet singh i did it last week and i put out the edited version also he explains why we should go to africa and how we should go to africa we have to go to africa and we have historic links we have great everything but africa is transactional today so what is the transactional things you have to do you have to go ahead okay if it start you right what is the effect of income disp- along with climate change and citizens we will will we see mass migration it's happening in pakistan so let us see what happens it's already started in pakistan it's only the first time is sovietization of the prc happening let's see i mean too early to talk of it i beg you to please pay attention pravin swani sani is let me talk he is no one he he's the is a waste of time don't even waste your time is a joker hats off to your fulfilling the vacuum on the chinese friend thanks a lot 
uh, we love you. Say you say money. Money is useless. What is your views of new recent news click episode? See, uh, I don't put it as a great thing because this news click thing and all we fell for it. The whole world fell for it. It is only now these are coming out. So since they are coming out, we will sort it out. Okay. Uh, they will compensate with Pakistan. <laughs> I don't think China will take anyone from Pakistan. Have you done? You have done extensive research in it. Thank you. Mm. Jai Hind, sir. Burma or Bangladesh ki taraf se Pakistan ki taraf se Bharat ko samvidit direct katre ke baare mein bataiye. Please. Humne to bataya hai. Bahut baar bataya hai. Jab humne Myanmar ke baare mein baat kiya, tab bataya. Jab Bangladesh ke baare mein baat kiya, tab bataya. Ab wo video bhi dekh lijiye Ashwi Kumar Kumar ji. You have done wonderful research. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, China recently restated the use of resisted the use of Sanskrit. Of, uh, not today. Uh, how long? How long the videos? We are all yours. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, academic and realistic talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sahaji. Uh, very. Comprehensive and well researched. Thank you. Recent survey in Singhua University showed that they dislike India more. That's okay. Let them keep disliking. Good evening, General Shankar. Your analysis on the money. My sources in China tell me that their economy is in a major decline. Decline, unemployment, natural disasters, decline in exports, asserting them. It's a fact. Right. It's only that I put everything together. If you put everything together, the picture is very dark. Where does Pakistan sit in this equation at the bottom of the heap? Will China use Pakistan for demography? No way. Chinese mentality is not to uh, you know, allow migration inwards. Power and water, there's no way. Nothing can go from Pakistan to China. Uh, your research is good. And question is, can you compare China with us to understand our weakness? I'll do that separately. I am very clear. Uh, wish uh, great research. Thank you. Very, very comprehensive. Thank you. Uh, I only hope people see this video in depth and you know give it to all your friends. And will remain the reference work for you. Look, Amitabh, I this is basically I'm building a research for China. Uh, Three days later, I'm going to the Chennai Center for China Studies, where we're going to have discussed China for over two days. I'm going to get more people on my show through them, and those people who do research, including young people, and so that we have a volume of research on China available in one source, which is open and public. Anyone can see anything. That's the whole aim. Maybe in a year or two, I'll have adequate volume in terms of videos. As it is, we have about 200 plus. Uh, with Fewer young cadets, pay could rise up. Oh, nothing will happen. Don't worry. Oh, Sapphire animation. Delight to hear you, General. Thanks a lot. Um, right. I've been asking. Yeah, thanks a lot, Anikod. I, I grateful to you. Amit Joshi. As per the history, China or any other country like China will try to divert people's attention to what's... Yeah, they will. Uh, that's what I have said. That's what I have intoned. I have intoned in my own analysis that I, what Paul Krugman has said. That's what Andrew Posen has said. So this is a live problem. Srinivas Rao, uh, most appropriate and intelligent analysis. Thank you. It's not intelligence. It's actually I have gone you know, steadily. There's nothing very illuminating in what my I was saying. It is pedantic to a large extent. I have. Just put the pieces together. You are not retired. You are in service for the... Yeah, that I agree with you. I will not retire. Uh, maybe it's preposterous. Do, do you think Xi Jinping might release next version of COVID virus to come out? I doubt. I, you know, even if it does, then it will be even more harmful for China. Because then no one will you know, uh, be with China at all. Right? Uh, 
uh, America will never ditch China for it equally needs China low cost. Yeah, look, that interdependency will continue. That's why Adam Poison says it will remain uh, the second largest economy for some time to come. I go with him because it's grown fat. It cannot go down, right? Uh, outstanding analysis, more the appropriate. Thank you. Uh, what about remittances going to China from Chinese citizens? It's not going. People are taking money out. Outward remittances more. Right. Yeah. Why can't we see rise Tibet issue to counter China? See, the problem with us, the Tibet issue is we've cut our own feet in 2003. We, we recognize Tibet. What we have done after that is we have got off the one China policy. We are ambiguous today on the one China policy. Officially, we say we are still with you on the one China policy, but many times we have not adhered to the one China policy. And now we have sent all our three chiefs to Taiwan for that Katagalan uh, uh, you know, meeting. It's a big signal. So, right, maybe someday we would like to do something about Tibet. Let's see. It all depends on how our economy grows. If our economy grows well, we can do something. And we need to. I am with you. Do you think China hardening their currency? Nothing will help. Global currency, no. Mm -hmm. Global power is a lot. And what is the power? Oh, <laughs> that's okay. That's not a big deal. Okay, I have come finished to the thing. I have answered all your questions. Whether it's a super or not, I would like to answer all questions, even if it takes time. It's over one hour, 40 minutes. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. And please do tell your friends to subscribe to this channel. And I will go over all this in Hindi uh, on Jaipur Dialogues. I don't know whether they have the time, whether people who listen to that uh, channel have the time to listen to so much. So give me a feedback, whether I, what parts I should cut out when I speak in Hindi. Because that's important. I want to finish in about an hour with them. Uh, thanks a lot. Good evening and Jai Hind to all of you.